we've been talking about the process of church planting. We've been talking about church planting now for the last four clericuses, clerici, or however you like to say it. Uh, we have been talking about how to reproduce ourselves and create communities of prayer wherever we find ourselves. And I believe that this is what we're called to do. It's what every generation of Christian must do in order to uh, ensure that the gospel passes into the hands of the next generation. It's also the Petri dish in which our children grow up and learn all of the skills of an apostolic community so that they can become better than we are now, um, you know, as cradle orthodox in the next generation, as those who know how to do the services and know the chanting by heart and have all of those aspects um, inscribed upon their hearts. And so as we talk about this, you know, there are many different aspects. We have uh, the practical church planning aspects that we've talked about, um, you know, comically, you know, using some of the evangelical materials that we've seen. And we talked to, about Father Victor Novak's uh, understanding of how to plant a church. Um, we talked about Rick Warren's understanding of, of what's necessary to create reproducing churches. Uh, we've talked about His Eminence's schema. Uh, for understanding the priorities of church planting and how we're supposed to do that uh, wherever we find ourselves. Uh, but I think it's really important to talk about what we're trying to do, as in what we're actually, even multi-generationally, trying to establish. And that's why I think it's really uh, very helpful to look at what the church looks like from a bird's eye view and see how ecclesiology um, fits into our church planting mission. And so we start with the baptism of Jesus Christ in the Jordan. And there are three different accounts of this baptism. Um, the most complete account is found in Luke 3, 21 through 23. And it simply says, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, you are my beloved son, and you I am well pleased. And this is arguably the first time where the Holy Trinity was visible all at the same time. In other places throughout scripture, we see the Trinity inferred, we see uh, the word in heaven, we see uh, the angel of the Lord uh, as a pre-incarnate Christ, we see many places where uh, the Father in heaven is talking um, in a way that seems to be either inferring a plurality of self or of a heavenly council. And in all of this, we see uh, a very clear Old Testamental hint of the true nature of the Trinity. But we only see the Trinity fully revealed. And as a baptismal hymn in the Byzantine tradition says, in the waters of the River Jordan was the Trinity revealed. We only see the revelation of the Trinity fully in the baptism of Jesus Christ. And I love this uh, icon here on the left. So the Holy Trinity was revealed, and we all know this. These are first principles, right? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They're revealed to be one God. And in this, we have the basic principles of the Christian faith, that Jesus is fully God and fully man, that he's one with the Father. He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by him. Anyone who's seen Jesus has seen God the Father, and that Christ sends the Holy Spirit from his Father, and not the filioque, but definitely a correspondence and tight um, relationship between the three elements of the Holy Trinity. And in the Orthodox tradition, we have very much from the beginning a preservation of this magisterial view of the Father. So the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are all one, and they are all 
a part of the Godhead and what can be said of one can be said of the other, but the father is still the ground of the Godhead. He is still the one who eternally births and who eternally emanates or, or precedes the Holy Spirit. And so we see this reasserted in the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed. And in the Nicene Creed, we have basically the outline for the mystery of faith uh, that provides the fence around all aspects of Christianity as we've received it from the apostles. And what was remarkable about this creed is that it was received by all the ancient apostolic communities. So all the ancient apostolic communities all recognized this as the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. There was really never even a doubt. And even in its expanded form, uh, the, the Syriac speaking lands were a little bit slower um, to take in the portion that was added by St. Gregory, Patriarch of Constantinople, one of the Cappadocians, um, the I believe in the Holy Spirit clause, but yet within 50 years of the creed taking shape through the course of two councils, Nicaea I and Constantinople I, the creed was received by all of the ancient Christian communities. And this is incredible considering how diverse those communities were and how divided they were later on over matters of very simple terminology. So the fact that they were able to recognize their faith and proclaim it within the confines of this Nicene Creed is really an amazing act of God and does show that the deposit of the apostles was one in doctrine. It's not a post fact con construct that's been projected onto history. This is something that all of the ancient apostolic communities were able to acknowledge and understand, except for the Arians, and we won't talk about them now. So the Trinity is defined by the creed. Yahweh, God the Father, the Godhead, the ground of the Trinity. There is always primacy of the Father in the Orthodox view. Now, we do believe that he is equal, that he is co-equal with the other members of the Trinity. That doesn't eliminate the fact that it is from the Father that there is eternal begottenness and eternal procession. So we have in the Word, the eternally begotten Word of God, who is the image of the Father, unifying God and man in one hypostasis. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and only by him can there be salvation. So we are not pluralistic or ecumenical in our um, reception of other faiths or other creeds. There is only one way to be saved, and that is by the man Jesus Christ, as the Apostle Paul says. And then with the Holy Spirit, we have eternal procession or eternally proceeding spirit who is everywhere filling all things and giving life. I don't know if you noticed that that is the prayer that we just prayed, the Trisagion prayer, the prayer to the Holy Spirit. And it moves in the world to reveal Christ and accomplishes God's will uh, in the world. Now, all of these are bound together in one common substance or usia. This essence is not a thing. So unlike the Latin understanding of substantia, uh, the Greek world always maintained that there is no substance or thingness in God. It is unlike anything that we can know or equate. So uh, there's nothing to which we can make an analogy of God's essence, only that it is not a compound, it's uncreated, it's unlike any created being. And so this is the usaic nature of the Holy Trinity, um, and it's the shared essence of God. Is that akin to, sorry, just a quick clarification, yeah. is that akin to how in the, the, the Latin way of talking about um, God and having existence and having essence, but that also not having it the way we would talk about it because they're the same yeah. thing. Okay. Well, they, the, the Latin fathers actually did recognize that there was a philosophical problem with using the word substantia. Um, and so you do find that they do dwell upon the difference of the substance of God to anything that has been created. So okay. they, they did, they did try to, they did try to create a distance. Unfortunately, 
Um, when you add the filioque, it makes the substance of God the ground of the Godhead, um, at, least, at least if you think about it simplistically. Um, a lot of Latin uh, Roman Catholic philosophers have said that that's a wrong view of the Trinitarian theology of the West. However, when you add those two differences, it does make it hard to get any other schema out of the Greek side of things. And so um, there's constantly dialogue between the Latin West and the Greek speaking East about what these categories mean. I actually think they would be very helped if they would allow the Oriental, the Syriac and the Coptic speaking churches to give a little bit of perspective because um, the Oriental theologians actually talked a lot about the difference of um, divine substance uh, to any created substance. You know, there's, there's different traditions that developed Trinitarian uh, schemas, formulas that developed in order to clarify what was meant here. Um, I think one of the difficulties we have in the West is that the Western mind has always tended towards um, legalism and simplicity. And so in the Western schema, we've always tried to make it as simple as possible instead of using a word like usia, which is in, in Greek, um, something really, it's a philosophical category that doesn't have an equivalent metaphysical, physical continuity. There's no, there's no usia in the created world per se in the patristic um, understanding of what usia is. So people don't have usia, people don't have essence. Um, because of its reliance upon those kind of uh, Platonic and Neoplatonic understandings of the idio, the form, um, that thing that which is heavenly, that is beyond the created world, um, it helps. It helps to kind of create a distance, a categorical and metaphysical distance between uh, the substance of God, between His usaic nature and any created being. Um, so that that might be one of the reasons why the Greek mind never was tempted um, to make God into a thing, uh, as we see in some of the, the, the more simplistic legalistic approaches that the West developed. Um, but at the same time, we can't just say like, uh, unfortunately the neo-patristic synthesis says that the West did always have that simplistic view and that the West can be easily discounted because you know they corrupted uh, from the very translation of the Nicene Creed, they corrupted the understanding of the Trinity beyond recognition. That's also an artificial position. And I, I find the neo patristic synthesis to be very lacking um, because of that kind of out of hand dismissal um, that is commonly now pan pandered uh, on the internet. And uh, if you are any of these chat groups that I've told all of you to get out of, um, <laughs> see that constantly bandied about, you know, that the West from the very beginning wasn't even orthodox because they used the wrong <laughs> word to translate uh, the essence of God. So yeah, they're always like, oh, Western man, bad, Eastern man, good. <laughs> <laughs> and here you have far Eastern man saying, huh? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I understand what they're trying to do. And I understand for the purpose of simplistic explanation and for apology, a lot of times these kind of nuanced answers get glossed over and, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a casualty of the process, right? Um, thankfully, that's what we have these kind of forums for, you know, where we can talk about the, the nuance and the difficulty. Uh, here in my schema, you see that I've uh, equated God the Father with life, uh, the Holy Spirit with liturgy, and Jesus as the Word with literature. And you can see here that there are, there are three different um, overlapping magisteria. We're not going to do the Stephen Jay Gould non-overlapping magisteria. We're going to have the overlapping ma magisteria. We have overlapping uh, aspects of uh, the church's received tradition. 
And so in the life of the church, we have living for God, the Father, in Christ Jesus, our Lord, through the divine power of the Holy Spirit. This is the lived experience of the church. And that comes uh, into contact with liturgy at that node that I've named worship. And here in liturgy, we have worshiping God by reciting the word and moving by the Holy Spirit. So these are, these are movements in accordance to the Holy Spirit's will. And then uh, we have at that right-hand corner prayer at the bottom, which is the ultimate expression of liturgy, is, is the uh, noetic prayer, is the submission of the heart and mind to the will of God. And uh, as we move over into the literary section of the ex express tradition of the church, we have the councils coming at that node. And you'll see I have um, worship councils and praxis as nodes where these various overlapping magisteria come into contact with one another. And so the councils of the church, the shared experience, the shared worship, the shared liturgical life of the church creates a canonical boundary, canonical definitions. Um, and it's a part of the literature of the church, but it's also part of the prayer and the liturgy of the church. And you'll notice how each one of these nodes just like the Trinity, they all share aspects of one another. It's one of the things that I've really been overwhelmed as I've thought about the life of the church. There's not a time in the church where you can really take away the activity of the Trinity. The Trinity is always present. It's always informing. And there's this cross reference uh, that occurs just supernaturally and beautifully at, at every point. Then in the literature of the church, we have the record of God's will and the revealed word of God inspired and preserved by the Holy Spirit. This inspiration and preservation occurs as a process within the church. It doesn't occur um, as a book falling from the sky. It occurs in the church as a part of the church's self-understanding. Uh, a lot of the canonical history of the church is wrapped up with the biblical history of the church. And in, in fact, the canon of the scripture itself, how we understand the order of the books, what books are received, what books are not. These are things that touch on the canonical um, conciliar history of the church itself. And so there in the left-hand corner, we have the Bible. And moving up again in this pyramid, we have praxis as the node between literature and life. That's where we apply the literature to our lives like what we did when we started this clericus using uh, an inherited prayer of the church to transform our practice, the life of the church as submitted to and expressed by uh, the, the literature of the church. And then we come back full, full circle back to the experience. Now this experience we only have uh, after we practice rightly. So we can't have the experience of the Holy Spirit in our lives. We can't have the experience of the mind of the church without submitting to the church and its literature and to the scriptures and to the canonical tradition. So these things are all wrapped up one inside of the other and it's a spiral. Um, I often see this diagram as kind of working in a clockwise motion and um, liturgy informing literature, literature informing life, life informing liturgy and this constantly spiraling process of these three different aspects of the church working together to inform us and to mold us and uh, to make us into uh, Christ followers, uh, disciples, um, little Christ, images of Christ. So the early associations of the heavenly hierarchy and the earthly hierarchy are important here. Um, we see in Revelation 3, and I'm not going to read this out, I'm just going to tell you that it exists. We see in Revelation 3 that the angel of the church, the candle on the candle stand, is spoken to as the leader of the church. Now, from very early on, Origen tells us that it was not disputed in his day that the angel of the church was the bishop of the church. Now, we have modern day scholars who might disagree with us. But traditionally in the church, there was a very tight association between uh, this passage of scripture, the angel of the church and its leader or its bishop. And you can see this in all the iconography that's developed around uh, the 
understanding of St. John's vision. In fact, the icon in the Eastern tradition of the Revelation is this icon of uh, St. John seeing uh, the Ancient of Days sitting in the midst of the candlesticks and, and uttering these words that we just saw uh, to the to the candlesticks, the, to the angel of the candlesticks, to the stars uh, in the candles. And uh, St. Ignatius, in his, well, extensive uh, pre-martyrdom uh, letters to the seven churches uh, to which he had relations and, and through which he passed on his way to Rome to be offered in the Colosseum to the lions, he makes a very clear set of analogies. The Trinitarian nature of the church is an icon of the Holy Trinity. And this is the first time that we see this. Um, the, the very latest date um, for St. Ignatius's letters um, would be in, what was it, 105? So it's a very, very early testament to how the church saw itself and how it understood its its own structure. Wherefore, it is fitting that ye also should run together in accordance with the will of the bishop, who by God's appointment rules over you, which thing ye indeed do of yourselves do, being instructed by the Spirit. For your justly renowned presbytery, being a harmonious of love, of which Jesus Christ is the captain and guardian, do ye, man by man, being become but one choir, so that agreeing together in one accord and obtaining perfect unity with God, ye may indeed be one in harmonious feeling with God the Father and his beloved Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Chapter of, of St. Ignatius's letter to the Ephesians. So you have, you have a very poetic, beautiful vision of how he sees the harmony of the church. It's this musical analogy. I love that, uh, that, that picture of the church as a harp. Uh, and then that last, you can continue on with that, that last paragraph since I still can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> Let all men respect the deacons as Jesus Christ, even as they should respect the, respect the bishop as being a type of the father and the presbyters as the council of God and as the college of apostles. Apart from these, there's not even the name of a church. Amen. So that's Ignatius's letter to the Trallians in chapter three. These are all wonderful quotations, and, and uh, I will have all of this up for you guys to look at later. Um, all wonderful quotations. But basically, it shows clearly that St. Ignatius, who is possibly the child that Jesus put on his lap and said, unless you become like a little child, you can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, that's the tradition of the church about who St. Ignatius was, um, the third bishop of Antioch. Um, but he he tells us here that he sees the Trinity in the order and structure of the church. And it's, it's a wonderful quote. It's a poetic way of seeing the church, but it also helps us understand a principle that I think has been lost. Um, it has been lost by Protestantism. It has been obscured by uh, Roman Catholicism to a point because of the overdevelopment of the, the, the ranks of higher clergy. And so the Trinitarian nature has, has kind of been obscured a bit. But anyway, we're going to go on and look at St. Dionysius the Areopagite. And St. Saint, Saint Dennis, as we call him in the West, um, was a pseudo-epigraphical writer. He was not the same as the uh, Dennis of Mars Hill of the Areopagus. Um, he was not the same as the biblical character. And we know this because there was quite a lot of furor over the use of his spiritual hierarchies uh, in the fifth century uh, when they just came out of thin air. And so we have, we have multiple places where various trustworthy bishops said, we've never heard of this guy before. We've never seen these books before. You know, where did you come up with them? And the language used, we know he's probably late 4th century, early 5th century um, Miaphysite. And that doesn't make him bad. The church actually uh, has decided to still use him, modify his thinking, and to um, step away from his more um, obvious Miaphysite errors 
because uh, he has definite myophysite Christology in several places. And St. Maximus Confessor is actually the one who helped to rehabilitate um, St. Denis. And so St. Maximus Confessor uh, starts using him as a overall commentary on the likeness of the earthly hierarchy to the heavenly hierarchy. And people don't understand that the first time that the word hierarchy is used in the church before it was always the word taxis, which means order. But um, Iriakos um, hierarchy starts to be used in, in, in Greek and then later on in Latin because of St. Denis's on the spiritual hierarchy. And he has, a, he has another portion of that work, which is on the uh, ecclesial hierarchy. So he definitely sees the heavenly hierarchy and the ecclesial hierarchy as a, as a kind of as in heaven, so on earth um, mirror. Uh, if you can keep reading that, Duncan, I would appreciate it. I mute myself. And now we have, as I think, sufficiently contemplated in the description of the super heavenly hierarchy, the incorporeal properties of seraphim, divinely described in the scriptures under sensible figures, explanatory of their contemplated beings. We have made them out into thy contemplating eyes in the person of the bishop. Nevertheless, since now also they who stand reverently around the earthly hierarch reflect the highest order on a small scale, we will now view with the most immaterial visions their most godlike splendor in the hierarchy of the church. The Ecclesiastical Hierarchy, Section 4. So this very clearly, it, it's one of the only places in the Ecclesiastical Hierarchy where he makes it clear that he's comparing the two and that there's a dichotomy, but also a mirroring occurring. There's a chiastic element where the heavenly hierarchy and the earthly hierarchy are one in principle, although they're different in position. Uh, one is, you know, eternally glorious in heaven. The other one is smaller and lesser in splendor. But all of the splendor of heaven can be seen in the way the church in its hierarchical function um, plays out these principles. And it's a, it's a very beautiful way of understanding uh, as above, so below, uh, as in heaven, so on earth. Um, this idea that's very Platonic in its origin, um, that God creates a perfect uh, functioning principle in heaven. And then that perfect functioning principle is, is then reflected in earthly function. And, um, you know, there, there are many people in the West now who viciously critique any kind of Platonic element, but you have to realize that Jesus Christ, he did this in the Lord's prayer when he prayed that things would be on earth as they are in heaven. Uh, you know, people say that, that Jesus was Aristotelian. I don't think they ever read the Lord's prayer. You know, he's, he's saying that there is a mirroring process going on here. And very early on, the church starts to see the Eucharist as participating in an eternal reality. The similarity between what's happening in heaven um, eternally as Christ offers himself to the Father in this finished work of the cross once and for all is represented in the work of the Eucharist. And these are one and the same. They're joined by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit in his activities is bringing the reality in heaven to us uh, through the work of the church and vice versa. We are entering into the eternal eschaton through the activity of the Holy Spirit. And so the, the church very early starts to understand that there's this mirroring process going on. Very early starts to understand that there is a, a true manifestation of the highest inclinations of Greek philosophy and that the Platonic desire to understand or to comprehend the true forms uh, that exist in the mind of the one um, truly are present within the Christian Eucharist, truly are present within the Christian experience. So the dynamic structures that came from this, uh, ways to picture the Trinitarian ecclesiological reality um, are very simple. And I shared this already this morning in the Clericus, something I've been working on for years, trying to understand how these things inform one another. You can see here that we have three orders. We have the deacon, the presbyter, and the bishop. The deacon and presbyter and bishop um, 
they play roles within the community. They're energized or actualized by the communion of the baptized. The origin of the power of the clergy is found within those gifts that the Holy Spirit gave to everyone in the waters of baptism. So that's why when ordination is referred um, to as the stirring up of the spirit um, in the New Testament, they're not seeing the clergy as something distinct from the laity. Clergy are not, um, they're not something that are placed over the laity. They're people who are pulled out just as the ecclesia is pulled out of the world. Clergy are pulled out, are called out by the Holy Spirit through the witness of the church and minister to that church in a in a individuated and particular capacity. So the baseline of our energetic reception of the grace of God is already present in every baptized believer, but they are called to specific function within an all male priesthood that is called out one step from that group of called out already. So it's in some ways, as the Greek fathers like to call it the ecclesia of the ecclesia, it's the church of the church, people who are called out to a more serious calling, who are called out to serve in a more self-sacrificing capacity, who are called out amongst the called out ones to do this work. And that in no way marginalizes or minimizes the role of the laity. The, the laity, the communion of the baptized, still is the core of the Christian experience. And this is why when you meet clergy who don't have a real ministry, they don't have real work for others, for lay people, you know that they're not real clergy. Because clergy who exist in name only aren't clergy. Clergy exist only in relation to the body of Christ and to the needs of the laity. And so that's one of the valid canonical reasons why the Orthodox don't have a merely tactile understanding of the procession of apostolic succession, uh, but also understand that there is a real pastoral aspect to the ministry uh, held in dynamic tension, that you have to have apostolic succession, but you also have to have a real pastoral ministry too. Those things are linked, um, they're inextricable. And one only occurs in the context of the other. And so we have the deacon here at the praxis node. And I think you can all understand why that's the case. The deacon is the servant at the table. He is the, the hands and feet of the bishop. He's the one who's moving amongst the community. They were the ones who, after the consecration of bread and wine, ran out to all those who were sick and couldn't come to the liturgy and gave the Eucharist to those who couldn't be in the synaxis of this assembly. So they're the praxis, they're the hands and feet. And then we have the presbyters and their chief job is what? They stand at the head of the faithful in worship. The, the whole goal of priestly life is the worship of the one true God and to direct prayers and sacrifices. So the priest is standing and making prayers and petitions for the people. He's standing representing the people to God. In some ways, he's standing in persona Christi, representing God to the people. He stands there as a bridge. He stands there um, in communion with God and with man. He stands there, um, unlike what Ignatius says, where the, the, the deacon is the icon of Christ. Later, fathers saw the priest more as an icon of Christ. Um, but definitely in both, we see the icon of Christ because Christ was a man of action and helped the poor and the sick and the needy and did what he needed to do with his hands like a deacon would do. And he also prayed for the people and had compassion on the people and offered himself up as a high priest. And in that capacity, he, he functions as a priest. And then we have the bishop. And the bishop is, is an interesting picture because I think in so many ways, Protestants have a real Episcopal understanding of what a pastor is supposed to be because the bishop is the one who's rightly dividing the word of truth. The bishop is the one who's the interpreter of the community. He's the one who's telling people how to understand scripture. He's the one who's telling the people how they should stay within the confines of the tradition as, as we received it. 
And so therefore, I think a lot of people, when they think of a pastor, a lead pastor, someone who preaches, who has you know, that strong gospel kergima, that desire to, you know, with, with fire to communicate the truth of God's word, I think that really is more of an Episcopal capacity. That is what the bishop should be. The bishop should be functioning in a prophetic role to deliver the truth and to preach to the people. And that's why you see uh, throughout history, all these wonderful priests um, who aren't good preachers. And you see some of these amazing bishops who aren't known for their liturgical or, or their literary finesse, but are known for their preaching. And you can think of so many off the top of your head. St. John Chrysostom is, is just one of them. And I think that's an aspect that has been gradually um, not lost, but definitely muted, especially in the Orthodox tradition where um, now the really only definition of whether or not you're suitable for the episcopacy is whether or not you're celibate. And that's one of the things that I, I think that we've definitely lost in the process is the, the focus on rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, celibacy is wonderful. I think you should be celibate and also a good preacher. Um, unfortunately, you know, in culture, as it continues to narrow and definitions become uh, more and more inflexible, it becomes very difficult to have all of those things in one person. So um, you have here, I think, a good schema on which we can now base the nine ranks of the ecclesiastical hierarchy. Uh, this graph was used uh, almost two years ago when we were just starting our relationship with uh, His Eminence and trying to understand how we would form one synod. So you can notice the, uh, the antiquated seal there in the corner that we don't use any longer. But you can see these, these stairs of hierarchy arising. So you have tonsor, porter, lector, exorcist, acolyte, subdeacon, deacon, and priest. Now, after this, we have bishop. And you could even, I mean, there are a lot of ecclesiologies that do argue that there are lots of things over the, the bishop level. Uh, we won't talk so much about that today, but we'll, we'll get a little glimpse of that at the end of the presentation. So the Trinitarian function of the minor orders then becomes a problem. We see how the deacon, presbyter, and bishop are used in the assembly of the faithful uh, for different roles, for accomplishing different points of those nodes, the practice, the worship, and the interpretation or the councils of the church. And we see uh, how they fit so beautifully into that schema. I also like the fact that the bishop's at the bottom. He's not at the top. It's not the papal understanding of, you know, grace flowing down from the top, you know, where the, where the Pope stands in the place of God. Um, I really, I, I like the fact that he that is first among you must be servant of all. There is an understanding in uh, ecclesiology where the bishop is really supposed to be the chief servant. Here in the life of the church, we have tonsor. And tonsor is merely someone laying themselves open to God, laying themselves out as a living sacrifice. What they're actually doing when they cut that hair is offering that hair up to God. It's an actual part of you. Uh, in, the, in the Russian baptismal service, uh, many of my children were baptized in the Russian church. Um, they, you know, snip off that baby hair and roll it up in wax so that it doesn't get lost. And they throw that little ball of baby hair and wax into the baptismal water. And they say, we offer this child up to you, O Lord. It's a figurative act. And of course, it's not actual human sacrifice, but it, in a way, is showing that the child is being offered up to God in this act of tonsor before baptism. It also is what we do with you when we start all of the various uh, ordination processes that you'll go through. Uh, the first thing that we do is we tonsor you. And tonsor is a monastic practice. It's offering yourself up to God and being called by a new name. Tonsor is a figurative death, um, saying that you've died to the world and you're now alive to God. And tonsor is also, it's an ancient practice that so many other religions, uh, Buddhism and Hinduism, and even some forms of Islam practice, where the shaving of one's head uh, shows mourning. It's mourning for sin. It's mourning over the things that you've done in your past. And you're asking God to clean those things away, to make you new, and to become a new creation. And so tonsor um, 
touches on all of those various different analogies and provides a symbol I think that's very important. And then on top of the tonsor, um, we have going again clockwise around this uh, diagram, we have number two, the porter, the one who opens or closes the doors, the one who carries about that which he is told to carry. Uh, this, is, this is where I found myself and it's so funny because when I read the description of the porter, this is like being a pastor's kid. This is, you know, the order of porter is what you do as a pastor's kid. My dad used to call me the assistant pastor of tables and chairs because that's what I did, you know, tables and chairs, chair and table set up and take down, you know, every service when we were in a, in a rented facility, you know, you had to put up all the chairs, you had to take down all the chairs. It was a lot of work. It was a lot of grunt work and um, it was very unappreciated and people didn't stick around to help. That always really made me upset. They'd all come and sit on your beautiful chairs, but then when the service was over, they left without putting the chairs away. And you know, you'd know, you be stuck with um, being the assistant you know, pastor of tables and chairs. That's the, that's the role of porter here, as someone who's just being a servant, um, opening and closing the doors, carrying the things that need to be carried, um, but they're facilitating worship. A porter could also be an usher, uh, someone who is helping others find a place for worship, someone who's, you know, walking up and down, seeking for a place for others. And then uh, the third order here, still going clockwise around, lector, one who reads. And this is in most of the apostolic churches now taken as the lowest order. Um, it in the Greek church is practiced as the lowest order. They don't have um, tonsor for non-monastics. They don't have porter any longer. Um, they, they just start off with lector. So in the Greek Orthodox church, uh, about a year after my chrismation, I was made a lector. And that meant that I was allowed to read in services. And many of you are now lectors. You can read legally in services. So we don't have the understanding of a lay reader per se, uh, unlike the Anglican church where lay readers are a common occurrence. We have an actual service of, of, of benediction for those people who are set aside for the order of lector. Um, and then we have exorcist. An exorcist is one who identifies and casts out unclean things from our lives. And this is a person who's given the gift of life discernment. It's the person who's given the ability um, to see past facades and understand the reality of, of hidden sin. And this is something that the church does practice as a, as a minor order, but one that requires the laying on of hands. You can see that I now have uh, a larger type here. Um, number four beginning uh, is uh, capitalized and in larger type. So the order of exorcist is a very serious order um, recently within our diocese, we've had several people who have received the order of exorcist, practicing exorcisms. So those who have received the grace of exorcism by the laying on of hands and by a particular work gifted by the church for exorcism um, function in that capacity much better. And I'm not saying that, that uh, people who just cry out in the name of Jesus are not effective, but there is a certain amount of discernment that you need for permanent freedom from these kinds of spiritual um, pollutions. And so uh, we've been talking a lot recently in the diocese amongst the various priests, because when we receive priests, we almost always assume that they haven't been given the order of exorcist. And I've done um, now two services uh, to impart the order of exorcist just um, since my reconsecration this fall. So it's, it's something that's very much needed in the church. It is an active ministry. And I don't know if it's a particular time that we face now where there's more spiritual activity than normal, or if it's always just been like this, but demonic attack, demonic manifestation, but demonic possession is on the rise and it is unbelievably intense. And in some situations, it's horrific. There's a lot of demonic activity going on right now. So anyway, in order to do an exorcism in our diocese, you must receive permission from the archbishop. And if you haven't received the order of exorcist, you, you first have to receive the order of exorcist before you do exorcisms. And uh, we also have a policy that uh, if there's any kind of 
uh, aberrant behavior or any kind of uh, disturbed mental um, activity that there needs to be professional help involved. So professional counselors do need to be involved. Um, you can't just go and exercise everything and you know, expect exorcism to work. There are mental diseases, there are mental problems that people have. And so instead of um, practicing a more uh, Pentecostal or charismatic style ministry of exorcism, this is a very controlled thing that we do. And one of the things I wanted to tell you about this morning when I mentioned exorcism and liturgy is the fact that there, there is an almost liturgical element of working through spiritual difficulties um, mm -hmm. where, where you are liturgically confined and defined in how you interact with people. It's not just an ad lib, you know, what are you demon? You know, I cast you out, you know, kind of thing. It's, it's, a, it's a liturgical service. It's a liturgical process. And it's something that you have to realize is, is very heavily regulated, like all of the orders of the church. It's not something you can just do on the fly. Uh, so we have uh, number five, the order of acolyte. And this is one who serves the prayers. Uh, this is an actual order. Uh, some people uh, do this in a lay capacity. I know a lot of churches, even Orthodox churches, that have lay acolytes. And it's the standard practice now in Eastern Orthodoxy to have lay acolytes. But it is an order, uh, and people can do it professionally. Um, in, the larger, um, in, in the larger Roman Catholic diocese, um, you can see people who are acolytes their whole lives, you know, very old aged men who serve wonderfully as acolytes. And that's a, that's a beautiful thing. And it's a wonderful ministry and the church needs it. Yeah. And then we have the order of subdeacon, one who serves the deacon by reading. And you actually see that the, the subdeacon is supposed to be doing reading in the service. Um, and then going around seven, the order of deacon, eight, the order of presbyter, and nine, the order of bishop. So you have all nine ranks. And these nine ranks they correspond with the nine ranks of the heavenly hierarchy. They correspond with the nine different ranks of angels and demons. And so again, on the earth as it is in heaven, we have a correspondence between the metaphysical spiritual reality and the physical incarnated reality of the church on earth. And um, not to say that they all function exactly in the same way, uh, not, not to say that uh, the, the church militant uh, expresses all of the glory or fullness of the church triumphant and uh, the nine ranks of the heavenly hosts, but this is the paradigm that the ancient churches always used to understand the function of the clergy. So when you understand this, I don't know if this takes blinders off of your eyes or not, but for me, coming from a Protestant background, um, when I started to understand this, it started to make sense of the entire clergy, clerical, ecclesiastical world. Started to make sense of all of it. And so um, you can kind of see the relationship between all these things. Do you have any questions or any thoughts before we move on? I have a comment and a question, both about the exorcist. So the, the liturgy thing makes a whole lot of sense to me because both the uh, you know, baptismal stuff about turning towards the north and I, all the works of the devil, et cetera, et cetera. And yeah. also um, when a catechumen ent enters like during, at the beginning of Lent with the salt and all the exorcism and all that, that stuff. And also why is exorcist at, at the top here, but under, but by the liturgy in the one you sent earlier today? Yeah, well, I was trying to, I was trying to keep it over with liturgy and in talking with Archbishop Anthony, I realized that I couldn't go according to the traditional um, ecclesiastical hierarchy and do that. Um, so in, in my research two, three years ago, when I put together that diagram that I sent out this morning, mm. I left out acolyte. Um, and I had over bishop, I had patriarch. Um, so if you were to leave out acolyte and scooch things around a bit, um, you would have the layout that I had this morning. But this afternoon, I could not make the parameters that Archbishop Anthony gave to me work out with the diagram that I sent this morning. 
And so uh, it was around 3.30 this afternoon where I finally built, bit the bullet and said, okay, well, I have to put it where it would fall naturally um, step by step instead of putting it where I think it goes. Uh, so scooching it around, you have all the nine orders. And I can see Archbishop Anthony was saying that exorcists are an expression of the Christian life because, I mean, literally that's what Christians do wherever they go, right? They go in and demons go out. You know, Christian life is basically a massive exorcism of the universe. That's what we do. Um, I still haven't experienced exorcism in that way. I've experienced exorcism as a manifestation of a liturgical process. Mm. So like what we were saying earlier, I think a lot of these things inform, there's almost every one of these points, every one of these nodes reflects the ministry of the other nodes. So in so many ways, I don't think it's, it's easily distinguished or differentiated. In other ways, I do see that there is kind of a progression. The tonsor thing makes absolute sense, starting with just life and experience. You open yourself up completely to God. Um, how that goes over to the porter and acolyte. Porter and acolyte actually do the same thing. I, I, I noticed this after talking with Archbishop Anthony and looking at the material that he sent me. Um, these lesser orders are like incrementally empowered um, functions that basically do the same thing. So here a porter is someone who's, um, you know, a gopher moving stuff around for the church. An acolyte does that, but in a prayerful capacity at the front, right? He's leading worship, but he's still, he's still kind of a porter. You know, he's still kind of, you know, a gopher. He's, he's the gopher at the front instead of the gopher at the back. So, you know, a porter, he's the one who's holding the doors, you know, in the Byzantine liturgy, they've got that wonderful, the doors, the doors, you know, that where they're closing the doors before they take the Eucharist, you know, the porters were the ones keeping those doors closed. Um, but the acolytes are in the front and, you know, they're opening the doors. The, the, the doors there in the iconostasis are being opened by the acolytes. So as one group closes the doors in the back, the other group is opening the doors in the front. So I, I think there's a, there's a kind of correspondence here that is really poetic and beautiful. In a lot of ways, you can see this kind of poetry, this chiastic reflection going on. Um, subdeacons and lectors. I mean, lectors can read anything that a bishop tells them to read, um, but subdeacons, they're given an actual reading part of, you know, they're supposed to be reading the epistle. The deacons are supposed to be reading the gospel. Yep. So, so there's, there's correspondence between these minor orders. Um, exorcist and tonsor, and this is just me saying what I've thought of in just the last few hours, okay? So, <laughs> we can continue to expand this and maybe you guys have better insight than I do. But an exorcist in the service of exorcism, he's adjured three times to live in holiness so that the demons that he expels do not attach themselves to him. So he has to be a living example of, of a Christian. I mean, in all these other orders, there's there's no three times when I tell them, you know, be careful how you live. But the exorcist does have that in uh, the service of being made an exorcist. I think I expressed that to you. That was very powerful to me when I went back through all the clerical ranks. Um, it's a it's a very frightening thing to think about the responsibility of an exorcist. You know, you can't deal with something in someone else's life that you haven't dealt with successfully in your own life. I think I, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, yeah, I think the exorcist belongs where it does now that you talked about all that. And also, yes, the acolyte is the liturgical gopher having served up at the altar for a year when I, while I was down in Texas, carry is especially at different times, holding the gospel book for the priest, the, the wine, the water, the cup, the cross, whatever they tell you to grab, you grab. Yeah, so I year over year. There is kind of a, there is a kind of uh, referentiality in all of this that's, that's very poetic mm -hmm. and beautiful. Um, and I mean, going around, if you, were, if you were to say that there are orders above the bishop, which we, the Orthodox don't believe that there are orders above the bishop. Bishops are all equal. Bish, 
Bishop is a terminal thing. But um, if you were to go around again and say, well, the bishops are under archbishops and the archbishops under a patriarch, um, you know, you could you could continue this spiral. And that's what a lot of these traditions did, you know, and they continued to spiral multiple times. In the in the Roman capacity, you have you know multiple layers of bishops one upon the other. You know, you've got um, metropolitans and archbishops, and over that you've got cardinals, and over that, you know, you've got the Pope. So you've got, you know, these multiple layers that you could add on top. So I do think that this traditional exposition of the nine hierarchies, as shown by St. Denis, and also um, as implied by the early patristic writings, makes a lot of sense about how the church functions and how these functions naturally arise from the ministry of the church. So even as a Baptist pastor's kid, I can say that there was a structure similar to this, maybe not exactly, but very similar to this, that naturally arose. So we had people who were trying to live holy lives. Um, they had been baptized in the name of the Holy Trinity. You know, the effectiveness of that and what that means outside of the apostolic context is debated, but you know, they were trying to live holy good lives. They did have a liturgy, three songs and a sermon, didn't have communion very often. They didn't think communion meant anything, but definitely there was a focus on prayer. And there were these roles that occurred, you know, people who lead, it's funny, um, number eight here, presbyter leads the worship. You think about in the big evangelical contemporary churches, who plays the priestly role in those churches? It's the worship leader. Yeah. You think about it, you know, think about the Hillsong churches that you've seen, you know, with the big worship leader dude, he's the mystic praying in front of everybody, you know, he's got his hands up, just like in our liturgies we do, you know, he's got his hands up, he's praying for the people, he's lifting the people up, you know, between his songs he's mumbling, you know, as fast as any Gregorian or Slavic, you know, priestly chanter would, you know, he's, he's going at it. And it's, it's really funny, you know, it's kind of a, a natural position to arise there, the worship leader. And then, you know, after the worship leader who comes up and delivers that heavy hitting sermon, right? He's the uh, Episcopal role. He's the lead pastor. He's the preacher in the, in the church, right? I mean, you see it constantly playing itself out over and over. Now it lacks the understanding of the apostolic ch church and of the apostolic faith. But these roles naturally emerge. And I, I think that's one of the things, if you look at this, you can see similarities to a lot of different Christian expressions, even those Christian expressions that we know to be deficient, either heretical or um, willfully trying to get away from the reality of the historic church, just reinventing the wheel again. So, Well, that's the problem with the non-denoms, especially the non-denoms that grow into their own, like, denomination yeah. it's like you're just making another <laughs> you're just reinventing the wheel <laughs> you're replicating this but you won't admit you're re replicating this and therefore it's really really kind of toxic because you're not yeah. even self-aware enough to acknowledge the structures you've made oh exactly and that's that's one of the problems with all this is that it just you reinvent the wheel several times you get so far down um, and away in this process of removing yourself from the original context that just by default in this game of historic telephone that they're playing with with the gospel you get incongruity right so when people reinvent the wheel so many times you know and they they move next door and make another wheel you know that wheel eventually becomes something different um, in content and and intention than what the original church was teaching. And I think we all can see that really, really clearly. And one of the reasons why we so desperately are trying to reappropriate that original wheel, you know, why we're trying to go back yeah. to the stability of the apostolic deposit of the gospel. Yeah, none of that Presbyterianism, get that out of here. They're stealing from us and they mistranslated a few things. <laughs> oh, quite, quite a few. And now we know exactly what words they've mistranslated, which they don't like to talk about. 
They are like, oh, you you guys don't know Greek, really. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Yeah. Lord help me. <laughs> so anyway, moving on. Um, there's so many things that we could talk about at this point, and it's it's pretty phenomenal. But patriarchal structures projecting Trinitarian ecclesiology into the world. So once you've got that that structure that we just showed then the natural thing is in the interaction and interface with national and governmental agencies and entities, other things arise. And that's what I was talking about before. You get these other structures where there's bishops on top of bishops. And, you know, this is, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting, huh? Oh, gosh. <laughs> the Assyrian hierarchy, the Assyrian church hierarchy is actually the closest to the fourth century understanding of how it was supposed to work. It is, it is very, very similar to how the apostolic constitutions describe the hierarchy of the church. So fourth century. Um, so you have a patriarch who's the archbishop over everybody, the metropolitan who's the city bishop, and then you have just normal bishops. And normal bishops were people who, they, they could be anywhere. They could be in a village. And um, that's actually where the archdeacon and core bishop um, come in because the archdeacon was was a kind of a, a mob like figure who'd knock your knees in if you didn't obey the bishop who is the deacon of the bishop of, of the of the archdeacon. okay the archdeacon is the hammer of the bishop so you better listen exactly so the archdeacon represented the bishop and there was a very serious implication for not obeying him because he carried the seal of the bishop um, and then the core bishop, a core bishop, core um, chore, literally means country. So he's a country bishop. He's a bishop in a village, a bishop without a lot of people. Now, later on, core bishop was made into an honorary position for priests. They couldn't ordain. So that's what you see happening in the late fourth, early fifth century. And from fifth century through the seventh century, the core bishop, bishop disappeared. Um, but, but it's very interesting. The Assyrian hierarchy here is almost identical to how the English church in its original context manifested itself. So if you looked at the, the ancient English structure, they had something very, very similar to this, where they had the archdeacons, the core bishops, um, and it's, 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 et cetera, et cetera, but definitely with priests and deacons, subdeacons, and readers. Um, so it's very similar to what we would know in the Anglican patrimony. So were archdeacons and core bishops bishops, properly speaking? Okay, so this is the funny thing. Archdeacons were not bishops. They were the representative of the bishop. Okay, that sounds Anglican. Yeah, yeah they're, they they're might they're be Anglican. priests. Yeah. Um, they might so, be priests, mostly priests, sometimes deacons. Mostly yeah, priests. well, they were supposed to be deacons, but okay, oh, we okay. haven't talked about one big elephant in the room, which is in the ancient patristic writing, you have the deacon associated with the bishop more than the deacon associated with the priest. Mm. So the deacon did the bishop's will, and the priests wow. were the council of presbyters who stood for the bishop in the Eucharist, okay? But they were otherwise not empowered to do the same kind of work in the community that the deacons were empowered to do. So you actually have canons from the West arising as early as the Council of Alvira, which was in the 290s, but um, later on it becomes very, very strict. The deacons were the primary power holders under the bishop. And uh -huh. that created a problem for the, for the priests, especially as the priests were relegated more and more Episcopal-like um, roles in the community as the sole officiators of the Eucharist. Because remember, before, in the earliest centuries, in the first three, three centuries, the priests were not actually the officiators of the Eucharist. Right. They stood in council. They stood in synod. They stood around the bishop. So the bishop officiated the Eucharist, and there was normally just one bishop per one place. And so that valid Eucharist celebrated by that bishop was then taken out to everyone. So that's where you get the convention, the canonical convention of one bishop, one city. So there's no, no confusion of jurisdiction. And the presbyters stand around 
the bishop and they provide him with a counsel. Now, a lot of you have been reading all this Michael Heiser stuff. Um, it's really just a heavenly counsel in every place. It's like you have one father figure who's the bishop who stands for kind of God the Father. You have this council of presbyters around him. And then you have the angelic hosts who are the deacons who are running to and from um, doing the will of the bishop. Um. So that, that's the original way that they saw the Episcopal function um, in its mm -hmm. place. Now, as the diocese grew bigger and bigger and more and more people became Christian, it became impossible for the bishop to provide the Eucharist for everyone in his jurisdiction. And so then you have the bishop empowering the presbyters to go out and in his name celebrate the liturgy. So that's where you get the altar stone. That's where you get the antimension. That's where you get the idea that somehow the bishop has to be present or um, allowing the officiation of the Eucharist wherever it's served. So the bishop, commemor the, the bishop is commemorated by the priest, but the bishop is also allowing the, the priest to function in a priestly role on his behalf. So it's a shared priesthood. Mm -hmm. So the, yeah, so with the, so the archdeacons would be deacons, properly speaking. Yes, deacons, properly speaking. And then yeah. four bishops would be. Well, they originally were like minor bishops, but, okay. but now in the Assyrian church, I would flip this if it were, if it were the absolute reflection of third and fourth century practice, the core bishop would be under the, the, the normal bishop. And the core bishop in the Syriac tradition, the core bishop was allowed to ordain all the minor orders except for priests. Uh, uh, so in 410, when they had um, the synod of Papa, um, which, is, which was in Seleucia Sistiphon at the time, in 410, they, they pulled back from that and said that the core bishops couldn't ordain any longer. But before that, they were actual bishops. Um, then it became more of an honorific thing that men could be elevated to to function as a bishop without actually being a bishop. It's like what the Russian church invented 200 years ago in the mitered priest. I don't it know if you guys know about the mitered comes from. priest, but it's a priest who functions like a bishop. He can have a pontifical liturgy and he actually has a hat. He has a big hat just like a, a bishop would have. Mm. Yeah, it's almost like in the Romans, the Roman church, the uh, it, it's not a, it's not as good as the it's example of me, but above being like a, a monsignor is like you're not you're still a priest and you're not anything yeah. it's not cardinal but it is something more than just well they have that they have the notaries right to the cardinals who who can even be laymen that still wear pontifical wear <laughs> <laughs> they, don't have, they don't have to be oh yeah you could be technically elevated to the papacy from being a cardinal without being ordained before that yeah yeah so they, they, they do have they, they do have um notaries pontifical i think the uh the ordinariate the anglican ordinariate was run until recently by someone who couldn't be elevated to the honor of a bishop because he yeah. was married um and right. it's it's very it's a very interesting thing it's a very that's a whole other topic but <laughs> Yeah, so you have hierarchy um, developing in different ways in different places. That's one of the reasons why I think it is universally understood by the Orthodox that the nine ranks that we just went through that are the local diocese is actually the structure of the church. And then on top of that, you have other facilitating roles that emerge, like the role of a primus, of a uh, patriarch, of an archbishop, that facilitate the communication of the church with the world and that facilitate the communication of church with church. So therefore you have the arch episcopal role and that becomes the patriarchal role about fifth century. They start um, abandoning the, the archbishop of Constantinople and start calling themselves patriarch of Constantinople, um, patriarch mm -hmm. of um, when you start to see the patriarchal role emerge, which is the equivocation of the head of state with the head of church. 
And so you have the emperor and the patriarch. And there was a time in the West where that was more understood and accepted, but that eventually was replaced with the usurpation of the Episcopal and the secular all in one exalted person of the Pope. And that's where the ecclesiological differences between the Eastern churches and the Western churches really become unreconcilable because the Eastern church really limited it to two heads, the double-headed eagle. And um, in the West, they united that all back together again into one single person. And it was hard for the East to understand and to interact with the West after that transformation occurred. Again, we're talking about the 11th century with the Ultramontanist, um, Cluniite, um, kind of German takeover of the papacy that um, standardized the canonical practice of the church, the celibacy of the church, um, the Eucharistic mm. practice of the church, um, and created a very disciplined monastic entity, which was a sight to behold. It was an amazing thing. It was an amazing accomplishment. And after the, 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 the Catholic Reformation, uh, the Catholic Church crystallized into something that is both beautiful and also terrible in that many of the ancient categories that we receive from the apostolic constitutions, um, from the ancient um, the foundations of canon law, all those things are no longer applicable or even understandable within the Roman Catholic context. Um, so that's where you get the great discontinuity between ancient canon law and contemporary Roman Catholic canon law. And that's also another presentation we could do, but it's, it's, it's profound. It is so different that there's really no co-referentiality any longer. If a Orthodox canon lawyer went to court in a Roman Catholic canonical court, he couldn't make a case because the ancient canon law of the church no longer holds the same authority, um, the recognizable administrative authority in the Roman Catholic system that it does within the Orthodox system. So mm. that's one of the reasons why there's no ecumenical dialogue really capable of bringing the churches together again, because the categories have evolved so far beyond the received ancient categories of the, the first seven councils that the Orthodox Church uses, that there's really no bridge back to that unless the Roman Catholic Church just decides that they're going to jettison a thousand years of their own history. I think really, I think also part of the problem is that I think if it had been happened, is that the codifications of the canon law in the East and the West happened very, very, very differently, even more than well, the canon. It haven't been codified in the East. The Nomo Canon in 14 volumes by Theodor Valsamon is just all the canons in all their contradictions lined up. Right, but there is the Codex of what I what I what I I'm merely referring to. Oh yeah, yeah, the Codex of Justinian. Yeah, and the West didn't have that, but then what we did have in the, what the Romans did do was in the uh, maybe it was as early as the 17th, the 18th, and 19th century to codify modern canon law which was at least the codex of justinian had the and the ancient mindsets and the ancient and medieval my eastern mindsets yeah who even if it didn't do quite all the good things as <laughs> it, it was still within the same stream well the, the the codex of justinian which is interesting is developed off of the 12 tablets of ancient rome so mm. so the 12 tablets if you know anything about Roman legal history, you'll know that those were the unchanging foundations of the, the Roman mentality for a thousand years. So the Pax Romana occurred implementing the 12 tablets. So the 12 tablets were the received law of the Roman economia, of the, of the Roman empire. And the Justinian Codex merely enlarged and focused the, all those ancient laws into one corpus that was non-contradictory. Uh. So it was not a precedent-based legal system. It was a principle-based le legal system. So it's a very different way of approaching law than how we approach it today in our legal system, and also very different than how law became practiced in 
the West before the standardizations of Roman canon law. So the Codex Justinianus, which is also called um, Codex de Civilis, which is of, of the civil, the Codex of the civil, the civil law, they made a very clear distinction between church and state, but attempted by the power of the state to regulate the actions of the church, which rightfully led to criticism from the Roman side, from the Pope, that it was Cesaro papism, that the Caesar was choosing, limiting, and appointing to his own advantage the activities and the personages of uh, the episcopacy. So in many ways, the cri criticism that the criticism that the, 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 that the popes leveled against the Byzantines was correct. That is what happened. And you can see that happening over and over and over again. When a patriarch didn't agree with the emperor, the emperor just replaced him. And that shouldn't have been possible, but it was possible because of Justinian's um, his very crafty calling of the Synod of Trullo, which was only attended by the local bishops of Constantinople and titular bishops who lived in Constantinople, um, who then appended the Codex of Justinian to the canonical acts of the fifth and the sixth councils. So the, the Quintisext or the fifth, sixth council uh, known as the, the Synod in Trullo was a very, very clever way of giving um, absolute authority to a civil document by claiming the status of an ecumenically received council. And this is this is a problem still today. Um, there are many, many Orthodox theologians who say we can't receive the acts of the Council of Trullo because they weren't ratified by the Pope, they were denounced by the Patriarch of Alexandria, and they were um, the next generation completely repudiated by the Patriarch of Antioch. So we have three of the major five Pentarchs rejects, rejecting the Council of Trullo as illegitimate. However, even though, it, even though it's not received ecumenically as a ecumenical council, it later on becomes very important uh, in the post-schism councils that Constantinople has to define points of doctrine, like um, at the, the, what is it, the fourth council of Constantinople when they're talking about the hesychastic idea. So you have people pulling back on um, the council of, of Trullo, the synod in Trullo, as being an ecumenical uh, statement of the mind of the church because it's so important at the time to define how the church and state interact. And they can do that through the Codex Justinianus. They can do that through you know, that, that civil code that was appended to church law. Um, it was never ratified by Rome, although Rome selectively uh, does codify some of the acta of that council as having official approval. So they still call it the Quintisext Ecumenical Council, even though the vast majority of the acta they reject. Um, the acta that they did receive, they believe have ecumenical weight. Um, but there's, there's a huge matter of interpretation now because the civil law can't be interpreted by the ecclesiastical law. If you know the difference between ecclesiastical and civil law, civil law can enforce consequences. Ecclesiastical law cannot. The highest possible consequence in ecclesiastical law is what? Excommunication. Excommunication, right. There, there's no authority to burn someone at the stake uh, or to chop off their head or do any of those things. That was, that was civil law, right? So all of the penalties that are uh, described in the Codex Justinianus are unenforceable by the ecclesiastical court. So we've inherited now at the death of the Byzantine state, there is no longer an imperial Byzantine state. We have inherited a whole codex that's unenforceable by the church. So if something is unenforceable, is it still the law? Not de facto. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a very interesting set of questions, right? And it's not something that should shatter our faith. It should allow us to see how the church through history has creatively dealt with their problems and how they preserve 
the principles of the apostolic faith in the face of overwhelmingly difficult political odds. And I think that's the lesson that we need to take away from all of this, instead of allowing it to attack our faith and say, well, you know, that might not be an ecumenical council. It has been received ecumenically by various churches at various times, and it has great weight. However, we can't say that the Codex Justinianus was an inspired document. Uh, it's literally ecumenical council. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, oh, well, the canon lawyers fight it out. <laughs> it, it is, a, it, you know, actually, actually, everything that everyone is fighting over right now, like between the ecumenical patriarchate and the, and the Moscow patriarchate, or between uh, our uh, Ukrainian patriarch, Filaret, and now this new organization under Epiphanes, um, this, oh, <laughs> this is all a result of Trullo. This is all a result of the ecclesiastical law being muddied by um, political interpretation that's brought in through the Codex Justinianus. Um, because it is very clear that within the canonical tradition, there could not be a valid church in someone else's territory. There could only be one valid church, right? There's no such thing as overlapping jurisdictions of valid churches. However, because of the political considerations that were present in Justinian's day, he allowed for overlapping jurisdictions between, say, the Armenian-speaking Orthodox and the Syriac-speaking Orthodox and the Greek-speaking Orthodox in order to facilitate unity within the economy of the empire, right? Because he had to allow for the diversity that was arising in a, in a multi-ethnic, multi-linguistic context. So, Literally, what we're doing right now is using the tiny little exceptions that come from politically appended uh, civil legislation to justify things that are otherwise in ancient ecclesiological understanding completely unjustifiable. Yeah, that sounds similar to some discussions I've had with Eastern Catholics and postulating about well, what would happen when if, if the East and West ever get back together? I'm like, well, uh, I'm just, that's a canonical mess. Let me tell you that one. <laughs> for, preferably one bishop, one place. I don't care if it's a and the churches can be whatever right they already were. Like I think, of, yeah, the yeah, but it's it's really hard, and and the reason is we just looked at how closely liturgy life and literature are are regulated overlapping spheres of the expression of the life of the church and that's why when you change a liturgical right it's almost impossible to have that as a single entity on the ground with another liturgical right uh, and that's why you get all these no change that's why we get all these um yeah incongruities between various different liturgical practices um so anyway, summing up, let's let's sum this up and then we can have more conversation here at the end. <laughs> okay. um, all of this on top of the bishop, like we see over here in the left, Eastern Orthodox church hierarchy, we, we see above the bishop, there's a metropolitan, there's an archbishop, there's a patriarch, there's ecumenical patriarch of Constantinople. You can know who made this diagram by who's in that position <laughs> because that is highly contested. <laughs> This is an oh, well. patriarchate created hierarchy here. This is not the hierarchy that all Orthodox recognize as being the actual hierarchy. So um, yeah, God, God bless so, them. So <laughs> the Orthodox would say it's the ecumenical patriarchate. The Romans would say who's in that position? Pope, the Pope. Yeah. So we have we have a lot of dispute um, after the Episcopal order about where things should be and how things should be. And there's a lot of flexibility. In some of these hierarchies, there's, there's one or two ranks above bishop. And some, like the cops here, there's actually seven. Um, and over here in the Assyrian thing, there's two more over them. No one knows who really is over the bishop because in actuality, in the Trinitarian nature of the church, there isn't anything. And that's mm. my contention. There, there isn't anything other than a bishop. A patriarch is a bishop 
that is given loyalty and credence based upon his function as the first among equals within a synod. Mm -hmm. Right. So, it's more of a practical thing than anything. It's a practical yeah. role of secretary or mm -hmm. convener of a synod, not, right. not a higher power, not a higher spiritual power. So if you get three bishops together, they can appoint an archbishop. I don't know if you guys know that. In the Orthodox tradition, you don't have to have archbishops to make a an archbishop. You can have bishops make an archbishop. And That's the reason, what, hmm. yeah, the reason being is there's literally no higher charismatic um, facilitation going on in any way yeah. other than the Episcopal, other than the bishop. So, you know, when we, we say Archbishop Anthony, Archbishop Anthony was made an archbishop by other archbishops, but that's not the necessity. Um, there, there could be, if all the archbishops died tomorrow, um, the bishops would elect archbishops to take their place and they would enthrone them mm. and they would be archbishops. So that is, that is a very important aspect of the orthodox ecclesiology that you need to understand. Um, because I know right. there's a lot of confusion about that as well. Which when you think about it, it has to be that way because all the, biblically and apostolically speaking, there were no archbishops among the apostles. If, and I mean, unless you're going to take the papal stance, but even then that doesn't work because it's the Pope, not an archbishop. So there yeah. were no archbishops. Yeah. So to get an archbishop, you had to just have bishops. <laughs> so that's, that's the ecclesiology that we're describing. And that's what we're trying to create every generation, what we struggle to form and what we're working towards as a whole, as a diocese, this is what we're working towards. We're working towards an imitation of the heavenly reality. We are forming ourselves on earth in a heavenly paradigm. Uh, we are in the pattern of the ancient church trying to follow that idea of the choir of angels um, speaking, singing, quoting back and forth between the various different ranks, all worshiping the one true God who is in our midst. So God who is in our midst, who sits enthroned in the Eucharist and in heaven sits enthroned uh, there as the word of God manifesting the fullness of the Godhead in Jesus Christ bodily. There in heaven, we have the perfect picture of God's ultimate expression of truth. Here on the earth, we come together through the power of the Holy Spirit in a natural and organic apostolic expression of that very same truth in a recognizably similar pattern, in a pattern that mimics the heavenly reality. And that's what we're trying to recreate in every generation to greater and lesser success. Sometimes it comes together beautifully. Sometimes it's maimed and crippled and doesn't look as good as a dot, but it's an icon of our salvation. It's an icon of eternity. And that's what the church and its orders do. They function. And this is interesting because when we're talking about icon or symbol, people assume that it's representing something that's absent. Actually, we're talking about a functional icon that functions in the capacity, in the roles that are energized by the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in the same ways throughout all time. And that's what we're trying to do with church planning. We're trying to create this icon of the heavenly worship in our homes with our friends and you know, to greater and lesser success and as we gain an experience, we come to resemble more and more this heavenly image that we reflect. So that's really what I think is a mind-blowing realization, what we're trying to do on the ground. And when you start understanding the vastness of what all this is and what it represents, you start to realize the incredible responsibility of the calling. 